Hi everyone, welcome to another edition of Leadership Revealed. So whether you're watching this on YouTube or listening on a podcast, I'm sure you're going to have an absolute fantastic watch or listen. Um, I've got a very good friend of mine, Jerry Lyons, on the podcast today, and we're going to talk about all things content. We're going to talk about his new podcast and giving that a shameless plug and anything else that just pops into our mind as we uh, go along. So without further ado, Jerry, how are you doing? I'm very, very, very well. I got I got up early. The sun's shining. We're recording this uh, before the school run. So, yeah, all is good in the world. Excellent, excellent. So we've known each other for quite a while now. And just as a, as a complete open and transparency, we've been working together for about 18 months. Um, but I'm absolutely fascinated with with your, your business and, and you because you seem to have burst on the scene over the last, what, 18 months, two years, would you say? Yeah, in the estate agent marketing world, yeah. But it's, it's a bit like one of those, you know, they said it took me 10 years to become an overnight success. Yeah, It's, it's a bit of that because I've been working with estate agents since 20, I'm trying to think when my, it all started off. So my background's in journalism mm. and one of my mates has got an estate agent in London, uh, probably 2012, maybe t- 2011. He said to me, can you write me one of these things called a blog? He said, you do writing write me one of these. So I wrote him a blog and he said, oh, people like that. Can you do me another one? So I did another one. And then over the course of five years, built up um, uh, a sort of bank of estate agency clients. And that was the niche that I was working within. And then it's, it's like I said to you, I make no sort of like secret of it. Then I gave up drinking in 2018. And ever since then, everything sort of exploded purely because I got more energy to put into stuff. Mm. And that's why the, the content club that I run is, is, has just gone boom um, and that sort of thing, really. Yeah. I, t- I tell you what we're really interesting for everybody watching and, and listening to this is to sort of give you background because we've spoken many, <laughs> many times and you are incredibly proud about the fact that you are the only sort of trained journalist content writer in the industry. So do you want to give everyone about a bit more in depth about your background and, and where you came from, that, that type of thing? Yeah, yeah, cool. So i do sort of really quick. So I left school with no qualifications because I thought I'm just going to go and work with my dad on a building site. I, I thought I'd, I'd be brilliant at building. I, I can remember the first day, I think I cried in the toilet <laughs> on, a build, <laughs> on a building site because I hated it so much. And I was there yeah. thinking, what have I done? I was 16. I think, what have I done? My life's over. Anyway, I had dead end jobs up till about the age of 28. Mm. Always did all right. It just got by by personality, I think. Um, and then I set up a removal company in 2000. And that went really well. But I think a lot of the, the, the how we done success with that was we just did what we said we would do for people. We were really honest, which was a bit unusual in certain parts of the removal industry then as well. There was people cutting corners. Um, but I sold the business within four years. And then I was 32, I think, or 31, 32. Um, and, you know, you get gardening leave when you sell, sell a business. So I couldn't go back into removal. So removals was all I'd known for four years. And then I thought, you know what? I've, I've always liked writing. I've always liked writing. I was always good at English. That was my best subject by a mile. Um, and then I just thought, I'm going to try and become a journalist. So I, re- I can literally remember sitting, I was sitting on my bed and I picked up the, 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 the mobile. I rang my local newspaper office. I got through to a bloke called John Comfort, who I'm still friends with now. I said, excuse me, I want to do work experience. Uh, and he went, well, how old are you? I went, well, I'm 32. And he laughed. He went, well, normally we have 16 and 17 year olds. He said, but you sound like you could be fun. So come in and have a chat with me. Is that what he said? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. John is good as gold. He's such a nice guy. And then within three months, I got a job, basically. So I, I did three months of unpaid work, got into the journalism that way, um, got trained up. They put all the money into your training. So you have to go through a two year training period. You have to learn uh, media law um shorthand and all sorts of things but it wasn't the 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 theory was one thing but it was going out there and chatting to people and meeting people from diverse literally and this was this was one day um in the morning i interviewed one of the richest asians in the country 
because he lived locally and he was in the Asian rich list. I mean, this guy's a billionaire. He owns care homes. I can't remember his name, but he's a huge care home and property owner. In the afternoon, I went to the homeless shelter to speak to volunteers there. And that was in the same day. And that was a great thing about journalism. Yeah. And then journalism, I went into PR because that's a na- bit of a natural progression because it's better paid, quite frankly. And then I sort of, sort of fell onto writing for, for estate agents from there. Wow, so it's been quite a quite a journey, as they say, just to get from where you were to, oh, yeah. to get in the industry. And, and I had a market stall for, for 18 months as well in the, yeah, 1997, 1998. That's great fun. I bet you, you said uh, something to me that nothing brings the punters in like a queue. Uh, I got taught that by when I was on the loads of my marketing, right? So I run a content marketing company now, yeah? Yeah. I would say at least... 70% of the things we do have their foundations, what I learned or what I picked up on my marketing stall days. Because yeah. you've got to remember, a market stall trader, they know how to present a sales pitch, the really good ones. I mean, it's a dying art, mm-hmm. but back then, 20 years ago, there was people that could do a sales pitch. They knew how to present stuff. Mm-hmm. So their market stall, the really good ones, had a really well thought out stall. And they would know things like, well, let's put the loss leaders at the front. That gets people to step into the stall and the stuff I make the most profit on, that's all on the back wall. Mm. But by then they've engaged them in a conversation and they're moving them along. You know, like you would get some fancy Dan Mark in American fella to say, right, this is called the sales process. Market traders have been doing that for time, you know, since the dawn of time, the good ones, you know. Um, so the market still was, yeah, going back to that, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd was opposite me. There was a guy selling towels. Yeah, and he was one of these, and he 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 would start, and he'd start, and he would never start selling until there was more than three deep of people. So that would be about 30, 40 people, and that's when he'd go bang because he'd said, "Once I get the crowd, once I get ten, I'll get twenty, and once I get twenty, I'll get forty people." So that's where that nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd, and that's we've we put that into our business with the exclusivity model mm. because we know once we've got an area and somebody's been told they can't have that area they'll join the waiting list. And- well, funnily enough, it's, it, obviously I've got a, a coaching training company, um, as you know, and one of the things that a lot of coaches do is, is scarcity and urgency. So they say only 10 people can join and blah, blah, blah. And if it's fake scarcity and urgency, then it's, it's a moral issue. It's yeah. a ethical yeah. problem. But if it's genuine, such as, so these people who have got like a thousand spaces on a webinar, but say there's only 50 pit spaces, it's, it's, yeah. it's not rubbish. Yeah, yeah, it's crap. Yeah. Yeah. But if you generally have got like the 100 one or the 50 one or, you know, for instance, you know, I can only take on a certain amount of coaching clients yeah. because, you know, I've got other business interests. And, you know, if, if I take on unlimited, I, something's going to give. It's the same mm-hmm. with you and your exclusivity model. And I think that that whole um, you've got to be quick because if you don't, your competitor is going to get it. I think it's a it's true. It's ethical. Yeah. But it's, it's a good way of from your point of view, from getting people to join the club. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. That and but like the the key thing there is as long as it's truthful and ethical. Yeah, it yeah. can't be like I, I, it always cracks me up when I see these digital courses that say there's only three left. Hold on, mate, it's a digital product. <laughs> there's, a million, there's infinity left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's as many as you want left. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah, but that model really works for us. It really works. Just, speaking of the ethical thing, you are probably one of the most ethically minded people i've ever had the pleasure of working with you're very big on the karma club do you want to tell everybody what the karma club i mean this is fantastic in this day and age for you to do this i think is phenomenal yeah so so the karma club is basically because we run a membership model so our members pay us a member subscription every month to access our services and since january 2020 it was always in in my mind but since january 2020 we were in a position where we could take a fiver from each member's subscription, put it into a digital pot every month, and then say, go back to the members and say, right, this month we've got 600 pounds. And it started off, it was like 300 pounds. But as the business grew, it's got up to about 650 quid a month now we give away to charity. But once we, um, at the start of every month, we'll go back to our members and say, we've got 600 quid in the Karma Club kitty. Do you have a local charity, community group, a sports club that you want to donate a hundred quid to, and we'll match fund that hundred quid. 
So that way the charity is getting, or the community group is getting double the amount that they would anyway. And as you know, and your businesses practice it as well. Um, estate agents are great for supporting community causes and clubs like that. So the Karma Club, since January 2012, we've given away, I think it's now £12,000. Wow. Which is good for us because we're only a small business, but it's yeah. a, we call it our, our key KPI. I know you love a KPI is not key performance indicator it's our karma performance indicator because we know if we've given 600 quid based on the way our model is and how we we want it like a proper business we're not like a charity but we know that we're doing well as commercially but we can also do really well by helping people socially and uh, and that sort of thing so it's a key driver for us and it's really good for our business as well it, it, the members love it because they're part of it um and it's doing a bit of good do you know yeah. what i mean it is building that community so you're helping the community but you're building the community within your within your state agency content club as well because people do like that whole giving attitude yeah. mentality 100 percent, and it helps us attract the right sort of agents like yeah. the, our members that stay thankfully we don't have much of a membership churn but our members that stay and the ones that get really engaged they're the ones that really buy into community anyway mm. So they're the ones that I will constantly support in their local, I don't know, their local schools or their local sports clubs or the local book club. They're getting involved. And it seems to be something with the really exceptional agents, I think, especially the independent ones. I think they all got some sort of either whether it's written down or it's just an instinctive thing. They get involved with their communities. Mm -hmm. How is the content club doing? Is it's grown all the time? Yeah, yeah. Now we're like 120 members we turn away more people or we add more people to a waiting list than we do take on purely because it's geog geography based. So that's good. Um, but the, the karma club as well has expanded into now we do, we've got a charity of the year uh, that we sponsor uh, and we, we encourage all our members, you know, like go out there and get a charity of the year locally because it's not just good for, it's not just a good thing to do. It's good if you've got staff because it really motivates certain staff will be, lit up just by the fact you know what i'm working for a company that's more than just putting money in the director's pockets mm -hmm. it's doing a bit in the community it's helping people so so we our charity of the year is a homeless company uh, sorry a homeless charity um and i think in the next i think it's next month i go out on one of their sort of soup runs to find out more wendy my wife she's getting involved with with them as well on a training basis because she does sort of like corporate training um so yeah there's there's yeah it's it's a really good that ethical side of things i know mm. it's a word that sometimes people just say oh ethical ethical and, and they just apply it to something like they've got coffee cups in the biodegradable i think it has to be more than that that's good don't get me wrong that's mm. a start but i think it has to be more thought out than that i think right what can we do as a business this is going to impact positively on our people and the planet yeah i wrote something on a on a an article on, on the group or on the agency growth strategy group called the say do gap. So what do you say and what do you actually do? Is there a gap? You know, if you say that you uh, um, are eco minded and eco friendly, are you just saying it for the, the promo and the little bit of kudos or do you actually do it? And like you say, just having biodegradable cups in your office or donating a hundred quid once every two years to your local chat. That's not, that's not good enough. If you're going to do it, if you're going to say you do it, you then you need to actually go out and do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. That. Um, so, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I totally agree with that. That say, say, do gap is such a good thing because my old man used to say that. He said, if you want to test somebody's commitment to anything, see if they give you their time or their money. Yeah, and so well, I can't. That's always been true in my experience. You know, like people say, well, I haven't got no money to give you, but I'll I'll give you a couple of hours help if you need it, or others will say, well, you know what, let let's support what you're doing there. Yeah, yeah. With that in mind, you've got a bit of a new project going on with your podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, it's called the Business for Good podcast. And it's where I speak to people that are running businesses that are trying to make a difference, uh, whether it's environmentally, socially. Um, and that that starts July the 1st. So I don't know when this will air, but that that will go out. And I'm just looking and small and large businesses, you know, I prefer speaking to the small business owners. Mm. Um, a, a funny story is I was I was trying to contact Brewdog 
to get them on for about three weeks three weeks ago because you know like they've made some things about how they've got like environmentally friendly practices and all this sort of stuff and they're a cool brand but <laughs> the, the say do gap yeah is, is well, you know, I was there's, a bit of a, yeah. there's a bit of a cloud around them at the moment let's put it that way oh for sure i was talking to my market manager on um on friday and literally she brought the say do go up gap with brew dog because all yeah. brew dogs marketing and promotion and pr is what a great company we are to work for and we treat our staff fairly and and all of a sudden a week or two later you're like really are you sure now so yeah yeah you've got to be careful yeah i i a hundred percent and 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 just with the business for good uh podcast the name the reason why i said it was i actually believe i did well I, i'm we're practicing it here we're not blowing our own trumpet but we are actually practicing it here before we're doing with the content club is we're showing that you can run a very well run good business and we were your your well you said for transparency you're our business coach you've been massive in the in that in helping us getting things together and we know we're near the finished article yeah but we're we're, we're we're trying do you know what i mean that's half the battle but i i can see businesses that not only do the right thing but are doing well because they're doing the right thing you know and especially like um a consumer's got a choice now mm-hmm. so if all things being equal it used to be all things being equal you know what i'll probably go with the person that i like yeah <laughs> but now people are thinking as well is i'll go with the company i like and what are they doing for oh so that's so here's the, the thing so that company does that for the local community i didn't know that oh so they sponsored little jimmy's football team mm-hmm. okay well, let's give them a try. Mm. Do, you, do you know what I mean? So it is, it's, it's, it's very good in terms of winning business. And I think it's great for staff morale because we've got a couple in a couple of people in our team that whenever they get involved in the Karma Club, I notice that they're, they're good, but they're really good when they're involved with the Karma Club side of things of contacting people about donations and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, one thing I like about you is that you've got a lot of subcontractors because that's how, the content writing journalistic world works. Yeah. And again, yeah, we've been working together, but you came up with this idea off your own back, which I, I, I thought and still do think it's a great idea. You wanted all your subcontractors, which are great, by the way, you wanted them to feel as though they were part of a team. Yeah. And you went and did a full-on presentation with them and, and, and got them engaged and got buy-in from them. And there's a lot of people, a lot of agents, a lot of businesses out there that could that could learn a hell of a lot about that. Because a lot of people think, well, subcontractors and normal contractors and, and then, you know, repair guys, if you're an estate agent or a letting agent or, you know, you subby out work to something like somebody like you for, for stuff. Yeah. But having that disconnect is actually damaging the business. Do you want to yeah. share with everybody what, what you did? And yeah, how it, I, you know, and it was exactly that, that word disconnect. Because I was a freelancer for years. And I can remember this is this was where it gave me the idea. And I said to myself, if ever I grow a business that's got freelancers, enough freelancers in it, or even just one, one more freelancer than me in it, I'm going to make sure they feel part of something. It's up to them whether they buy into it. Yeah. But part of that is me pitching it to them and saying, right, this is what we're trying to achieve. But I was at a Christmas party of a um, <laughs> one of my big clients five years ago. And I did a lot of work with them. But I was there at the, the Christmas party and I realised I don't know anyone. I know the boss. And that was it. And I was standing around like a spare one at a wedding, <laughs> you know, on the sidelines waiting to be asked to dance. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I sort of put myself, when, when, when we're in a position, we're going to do the presentation like I showed you. And it's it basically, the, I outlined the presentation was right. This is what we're trying to achieve. These are our standards. Mm. These are our promises to our clients but also these are our promises to you as freelancers so we're going to have monthly meetings uh which you can be in on because you get paid hourly so you know you get paid to be there it's, it's not out your own pocket sort of thing or you can donate that half hour to a charity of your choice they all went for the charity of the choice which showed me ah right that's good they buy into our values so it's, it's like a bit of a filtering way of doing things as well but also we made a simple promise to them we said, look, if when you put your invoice in on the last Friday of every month, we will pay it on that day. So we'll pay it. It's, it's not, the worst thing for a freelancer, and I know because I've been there, is waiting to get paid and then chasing. Now, companies need to realize 
right? Two things strike me there. If you can't pay a freelance quickly, what's that say about your company? I can remember being told, we've got to wait for some money to come in before we can pay you. My bills weren't huge. So that makes me think, Jesus, these guys could go pop. If they're that desperate, do you know what I mean? So commercially, we always say, right, we've got cash reserves. Um, we're ready for that last Friday of the month when all our bills come in. We prioritise paying our people first. We, you know, we pay everyone, but they'll get the freelancers will be paid on that day. That's non-negotiable. And you've seen our non-negotiables. Mm-hmm. That's one of them. Um, and that goes massively into attracting and keeping. And remember, I think sometimes uh, companies are guilty with freelancers are thinking, oh, they're freelancers they need us more than we need them mm. which could be could be true but a good freelancer has options <laughs> the good ones you can get any old freelancer to work with with you mm. but if you want a really good one and you want to keep them there's a lot of people vying for that person's time so why not treat them well why not make them feel part of something why not go out your way to know when their birthday is and send them a 30 pound amazon voucher that's what we tend to do or if they've just had a baby send them some uh, cook vouchers are great ones the frozen food thing for people for newborn parents so we've done a few of those make them feel part of something you know what, what you said there is they need us more than we need them and i know it was only an example but if any boss or business owner thinks that of subcontractors or their staff then i think that just says more about the staff than it does about the relationship it should be a, a case of well you're the, the part of the team you wouldn't think that about your, your, you know, your close family or your close friends. But why would you think that of, of, of the contractors? It should be a, a symbiotic relationship working together rather than, you know, an us and them. And I think that's a, a lot of issues with small businesses. They don't, they don't see it like that. They do think as though I'm more important. And yeah. you can't do that in business because, yeah. as you quite rightly say, a good subcontractor will be able to have options and be able yeah. to drop you in it as much as you can drop them in it. And you don't want that too disruptive we've actually had it happen one of our sort of best freelancers in the team has shaved off hours with one other person to come and do more for us Mm. because we've basically looked after her a lot better and she's important to us and we she shares our values and that goes back to the business for good type stuff you know we want people that and it was it was almost a bit of a it was an unwritten test when i said to people you can either charge us for your half hour that you spend on the calls when we do the monthly meetings or just let me know and I'll donate it, the money to a charity of your choice. Cause I thought if they charge, that's fine. No problem with that. But they all said, no, give the money to charity. Yeah. So they think, right, big box ticked. And there was no pressure. We didn't sort of make, it was a very throwaway, put it on your invoice or let me know what charity. And then after the call, I've got six people saying, donated to this lot donated to that lot so that was good do you think with with covid uh, by the way i agree with absolutely everything you said there what we've done in the last 12 months is that realized that with people not wanting to move jobs because of covid and security and either they're currently on furlough or have to move jobs to give up furlough or whatever it is that you've got to be different if you want to recruit people people aren't necessarily as interested in the highest wage or the highest earning potential is what they may have used to it's it's all about how are they going to be treated so people aren't prepared to be put up with being treated poorly in the absence of being treated fairly and correctly so things like we we've given everybody the birthday off we've um, allowed people to yes money's important because it pays the bills but we've got you know certain other things that we've got going on in the business like flexi time for certain people and, and you know increase their earnings potential and you know bonus schemes and all that the feedback has come back and we've introduced that staff survey and the staff yeah. survey was was absolutely brilliant to listen to them what is important to them so do you think that COVID is actually the majority of people now just want to be enjoy the work a bit more rather than the money I, I think that might have yeah I think that was changing before COVID but COVID accelerated it like it has yeah. many things um and there's that thing where people want to feel appreciated yeah so we'll always look out for a really good bit of work. Don't get me wrong. It's not like, we're not like a hippie commune. It's not a kibbutz. <laughs> it's not a cool. business. It's a business, but we appreciate our team. Yeah. So when they do something good, we'll say, that's brilliant. I'll make a point of seeing stuff and go, right, if it's good, 
we'll let them know it's good because people like to you you listen look at all the things you've achieved mm. but you like to feel appreciated still do you yeah, of course yeah do you know I mean, same with me. I like when somebody says, oh, you know what? I get more of a, I, honestly, I get more of a buzz out of a Google review than I do a sale. So we could make a thousand pound sale with some guides, but I, I think I get more of a kick out of the, somebody giving us a five-star Google review. It's yeah. Like, oh, yeah. So if I feel that as a business owner, people are people. It don't matter what position they are. They want to feel appreciated and just like told you you're doing a really good job. And especially if you can make it as attractive as possible to attract the best staff. Mm. And like we even do things, um, we're looking at sort of p- providing training for freelancers on certain things in the, within the business, but it's going to benefit them. And one of my friends said, he said, well, why are you training them? He said, because they can leave tomorrow. I said, well, yeah, but they might not. Yeah. <laughs> you know? If they're going to be working with us a year, it's better that they learn this now. Than, and, and, and we take the risk that, the, yeah, they could leave, but you know what? They're recruited because they're good people. So if we've helped a good person, Learn a bit more. What's wrong with that? Do you, I love that. I mean, there's a, there's a good phrase that Richard Branson um, came up with is train them so they could leave, treat them so they won't. And yeah. It, it benefits the business. If, if you want not necessarily underperforming staff, but staff that aren't living up to their potential, whether it be a employed or, in your case, a contractor, and you don't want to train them in case they take that knowledge and leave, then you've got to be prepared to accept that they won't ever reach their potential and therefore your business won't reach the potential. I would rather have someone absolutely maximizing every fiber of their being, smashing it out of the park, bringing all the good stuff to my business and my business benefits. And they only be with us for a, a couple of years and then they move on. It's like relationships. You know, I'm not, I'm not with the same, you know, girl, my first ever girlfriend and most people don't because relationships start and relationships end. Yeah. So, you, you know, you can't sort of hold back on treating people and, and giving them the potential. And if they're, if they're any good, the staff member will understand that they're not being invested in yeah. and it will speed up the rate that they leave you in the first place. They leave, yeah. And we start off, and I said this in the presentation of the initial one to the first, um, the first presentation we ever done to our team was our default setting is we trust you implicitly mm. until until you show us we can't trust you Mm. so trust them to say right we're going to put you on this course but we want you to work with us for six months we realize things can change but you know Mm. we'll invest in you yeah it's not a problem i think that's an absolute fantastic note to uh to end this podcast on jerry i just want to say thank you so much i absolutely love the idea of the karma club and um the podcast and Wish you the very best. And uh, um, once again, just thanks so much for coming on the podcast and uh, best of luck. Cheers, mate. Always a pleasure.